Hey, y'all. Anybody happy to be in the presence of God today? Come on, if you're happy that Jesus died and rose again, would you just lift up a shout of praise? God, thank you. Thank you, God, for Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. Hi. I love you. So good to see you. Happy New Year. We made it. We already here. We might as well give God praise. I ain't even got to wait for him to do something. I'm just going to give him praise now. So grateful to be here. Honored to be able to serve once again. Um, I'm so grateful for your pastors. So grateful for pastors John and Aventer Gray. These are my friends. I love you so much. I honor you so much. I thank God for both of you so much. Um, I want to dive straight into this word because I'm, I am full. Um, anything I say, um, blame Pastor John. <laughs> or blame your media team because they took a clip from an exhortation that he gave uh, during uh, the service last week and I saw that clip and the Holy Spirit gave me this word. Out of his mouth came God saying this word to me. And this is what I want to share with you. So if you have your Bibles, I want you to go to the book of Exodus chapter number three. And it is the custom of this house to stand for the reading of God's word. The book of Exodus chapter number three. Though I have everything in this Bible memorized in KJV, I read from NLT because it just irons out some wrinkles. So no matter what version you have, I believe every theologian is trying to get the text correct. And uh, New Living Translation just happens to be my choice today. Exodus chapter number three, I'm going to read eight verses in your hearing. I'll give you the title of the message and then I'll pray. Is that all right? Yeah. Exodus is the second book in the Bible. One day Moses was tending the flock of his father-in-law, Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led the flock far into the wilderness and came to Sinai, the mountain of God. There, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a blazing fire from the middle of a bush. Moses stared in amazement. <gasps> Though the bush was engulfed in flames, it didn't burn up. This is amazing. Moses said to himself, why isn't this bush burning up? I must go see it. When the Lord saw Moses coming to take a closer look, God called to him from the middle of the bush, Moses, Moses, here I am. Moses replied, do not come any closer, the Lord warned. Take off your sandals, for you are standing on holy ground. I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. When Moses heard this, he covered his face because he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord told him, I have certainly seen the oppression of my people in Egypt. I have heard their cries of distress because of their harsh slave drivers. Yes, I am aware of their suffering. Said a different way, I see them in their low place. So, I have come down to rescue them from the power of the Egyptians and lead them out of Egypt into their own fertile and spacious land. It is a land flowing with milk and honey. The land where the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, 
Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites, and websites? I added the last site. That's not in there. Just wanted to make sure y'all were paying attention. The land where they all now live. I'm very interested in this uh, eighth verse, this statement. It is a land flowing with milk and honey. It is my assignment to teach, preach, however it falls out of my mouth, on this first Sunday of the new year, milk and honey. Say it with me, milk and honey. Honey, on my cadence, milk and honey. A little louder, milk and honey. One more time, real loud. Milk and honey. God, thank you for milk and honey. Amen. You may be seated. I pray quick. The book of Exodus is the book of exits. It is the book of transition. It's the book of get me out. <laughs> it's the book of let me out. It is the book of let my people go. It is the most storied narrative in Israel's culture outside of Jesus himself. The only one that God compares it to is the return of the children of Israel back into their land from exile. We all know, or at least have heard, the story of Moses. And we pick up in chapter 3 uh, after understanding what chapters 1 and 2 really give us the context of. That... Uh, through divine providence, Joseph was sold into slavery by his brothers to become the second most powerful man in all of Egypt beside Pharaoh, all of the sons of Jacob, and uh, all the people that would be Israel at the time wind up in Egypt, and then there arose a Pharaoh that knew not the God of Joseph. Ain't it crazy how a season can change? Isn't it wild, like, you can praise God for the job in January and hate the job in February? <laughs> like, you pray for the provision, you got it, and you're like, why do I work for you? But, but, but even the change was providential. Because the more that they were afflicted, the stronger they grew. Moses is born into a climate uh, that has uh, a dichotomy for him. Though he is born an Israelite, he is raised as an Egyptian. He is warring with the culture that he gets to enjoy, but the DNA that he's born with. Not knowing what to do with that as a young man, he sees an Israelite fighting an Egyptian. An Egyptian is beating him, and he rises up and murders the man. A straight-up 817. Kills an Egyptian and winds up a fugitive. This is where Exodus 3 begins. Moses is a fugitive from Egypt. Moses is a murderer when God talks to him. This should give everyone in here hope. If you ever thought that God would not use you because of your past, look no further than what I just read. This wasn't a consecrated man who's praying in the spirit, having devotional time, waiting on a word from the Lord. This is a murderer who has been on the loose, 
who's farming with a family that is disconnected from his entire heritage, and that's who God chooses to speak to. The murderer. He is tending his flocks. A fire breaks out. And he's seen fires in his region before, but they all burn out. The fire didn't, wasn't the issue. It's that the fire didn't go out. He's seen the fire before, and he would move his flocks along, and then the fire would at some point go out, or it would spread, and he would know where to move his herds next. But this fire is staying contained. It doesn't jump to anything else. It's just burning, and it's not extinguishing itself. It's not burning out. This catches his attention. What is this? I must go see it. He starts walking over to the, 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 the burning bush, and God speaks from the bush. Imagine the thoughts that Moses is having. Am I dehydrated? I should have ate something this morning. I should have slept a little longer last night because I think this bush... <laughs> See, we read stuff and we think about it like in the cinematic movie. This is a regular, degular dude on a regular, degular day having an extraordinary experience with a bush that is burning. He walks over to it. This is interesting. Moses. Moses. Here I am. Take your shoes off. The place you're standing is holy. What makes it holy? God is there. I hope that helps at least 100 people in the room. What makes the place holy is that God is there. You could be in the middle of a bar. If God shows up, the bar just got holy. You could be in the middle of a trap house. If God shows up, trap house just got holy. See, don't think that he's just in this building. He is in your apartment. He is in your car. He is in your cubicle, wherever God is. It just became holy. He said, take your shoes off. The place that you now stand is holy because I'm here. Quickly, his sandals come off. He's barefooted. And then a conversation ensues. He says, hey, here's what I want you to know. I see the low place my people are in. I have heard their cries. They have not gone unnoticed, nor have they been ignored. I know I didn't answer them the first time the tears started to stream. I know that they have been waiting not for years, not for decades, for a couple of centuries. Sometimes we think that because God's not coming now, that he's not coming. But since all things work together for good, he understands that there is a right time to bring you out. There was a right time to bring you out of the bondage. There was a right time to bring you out of the issue. There was a right time. Because if it's not the right time, the deliverance won't be sustained. So he says, um... I've heard their cry, I see their low place, and I'm going to deliver them. That sounds like, well, hand them up. Do what you do. Not understanding that God, anytime he says he's about to do something, what he's trying to tell you is we're about to do something. Because God partners with us to accomplish his will in the earth. May I remind you that God hasn't done anything in the earth outside of the assistance of man 
since Genesis. I'm going to let this marinate because everything that God created prior to man, man could not assist him with. So the first six days of creation is the establishment of everything God wanted in the earth. Man couldn't be here because man couldn't help him. On the sixth day, he places Adam into the garden and he says, now I need you to be fruitful, multiply, redue, uh, subdue, and replenish. That's what you can handle. You can't handle creation, but you can handle management. So since Genesis 2, God has locked himself out of earthly affairs. And anytime he gets ready to do something in the earth, he must come back into connection with the God he gave, with the man that he's given dominion in the earth. Am I talking to anybody in here? So you see nothing after Genesis 2 where God's doing something that does not include a man or a woman because he gave us dominion here and since he gave us dominion here he has to partner with us murdering us adulterous us lying us deceitful us corrupt us sinful us he's out of options he gotta use one of us Noah just happened to be the most righteous of the ratchet. He was like, I can't, I mean, I got, I got to pick one. Uh, you with the hoodie, uh, just come through, come through, come through, because I, I got to use one of you. God don't have nobody else to use but us. So the fidelity that we should have to scripture, the fidelity that we should have to living a holy life is not because uh, in our piety he chooses. No, he chooses and then says, I hope that my choice makes you make better choices. Yeah. Trying, to, trying to cook. I hope in me choosing you, you can be so honored by it that you'd put down pornography and you put down lying and you would put down alcohol and being inebriated and that you would put down deceptive, that you would put down your anger, that you would put down your judgment. I hope that in me choosing you, in me showing you my love for you, you can then show your love for me. He says, he says to him, uh, I'm going to take them out of their bondage to a place that is so beautiful, so almost romantic. It is, it is their own fertile and spacious land. Then he makes three, these three words that this is what I heard when I watched the clip uh, of Pastor John last week. He said, I'm bringing them to a place flowing with milk and honey. There is not a little bit of it. There is a whole lot of it. The place is brimming with it. It was, it was almost like it was oil. It was such abundance that it would just be magnificent for them to behold. Imagine eating garlic, leeks, and onions. And then you have the opportunity to be in a land flowing with milk and honey. The promised land. Sounds like dessert. You, you go from eating all this stuff that makes your breath stink garlic, leeks, and onions? Two of those will have your breath humming. And then I'm going to bring you into a place 
that will leave a sweet taste in your mouth? He, he told them, I'm going to take you out of this bondage into this place. But he does not explain the process. This before and after picture sounds amazing. Egypt, promised land. Garlic, zinc, and onions, milk, and honey. That sounds amazing. When do we start? Today. We're going to start right now. But what I need to tell you and what my assignment is, is to put into proper context what milk and honey really is. Because we as Gentiles, especially in the Western church, have a romanticized view of the promised land. When we hear the promised land, we think about all the good. When we hear milk and honey, we have imagery of a milky waterfall. of honey just dripping into little bear-shaped jars. We think of milk and honey, and, and we think whole milk, 2%, almond, oat milk, coconut milk, cashew milk, rice milk, whatever option you would like, in abundance. Just gallons and gallons of milk. Just jars and jars of honey. You will try la 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 into the promised land is tra la la la. The promised land is tra la la la. The promised land is tra la la la. And because we live in the most glamorized country in the entire world that knows how to put Jesus glitter on everything, we don't hear it as the first person audience did. The first person audience would hear this promise and they wouldn't think the way we think. Oh my goodness, a land flowing with milk and honey? Just for me? Gallons and gallons of milk? And jars and jars of honey? That's not how the first person audience heard a land flowing with milk and honey. Because as agriculturalists and farmers that work the land, here's what they heard when they heard the promise of milk and honey. Work. They didn't hear gallons and gallons of milk and jars and jars of honey. They heard hundreds of thousands of cows and thousands and thousands of bees. When they heard there's a land flowing with milk and honey, what they understood is there is an uncultivated land that you are sending us to, and in order for us to enjoy what you've put there, we're going to have to put systems in place, and we're going to have to go out and chase all of these cows, and we're going to have to become cow men and cow girls and herd all of this. What they heard was work. That, that cows were all over, littered across the landscape, and that would have to bring them all down, put them in one place, so good. and get to milking. What they heard was hand cramps. What they heard was getting up around four or five o'clock in the morning to milk cows, to pasteurize the milk, 
so that it could feed their family and feed the community. When they heard a land flowing with honey, what they heard was, we about to get stung by bees. Hope you don't got no allergies. The promise of milk and honey is a promise to work. And it would have been enough if it was just that. Then he goes further. He says it's a land flowing with milk and honey, which they would have heard as now you got to work. Now you have to cultivate. Now you have to corral. Then he goes, oh, there's some other people there too. So, so it's not just milk and honey. It's Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. They live there. So there's a lot of cows, a lot of bees, and a lot of people. And this is your promise. I promise you that. Well, God, ain't you going to clear it all up before we get there? Nope. Your promise comes with problems. I don't know if you want this. I don't know if this is a happy new year message for you, but I need somebody in here to know your promise comes with a promise. You think that you're going to become a successful entrepreneur and that you're going to step into that promise and not have a problem? There'll be a problem with payroll. There will be a problem with employees. There will be a problem with vendors. There will be a problem with getting your product distributed to a different country. With your promise will be problems. And if the only thing you can do is shout for the promise, but can't stand up to the promise, then you will die in a desert. I, I, I want to give you the six things you need to enter the promised land. And these are, these are practical application points. Because if we just shout over the promise, but we don't have any tools, we will visit the promised land, but we will not stay there. I cannot tell you how many people I know that have visited their promise but have not stayed in their promise because they did not know how to maintain their promise. The average athlete that plays professional sports is in and out of whatever league he or she chooses in three to five years. And most of them at the end of that three to five years were as broke as the day they went in. They received life-changing money, but they did not receive a life-changing mindset. So their life changed, but their mind didn't. So by the end of it, they're driving you around the house they used to live in. Because they didn't change the way they thought. Thank you, Holy Spirit. They did not repent. All repentance is is changing your mind. Some of us in here think that we only need to repent from sin, but some of you all need to repent from the way you were thinking as a child and grow up. Some of you all need to repent from a poverty mentality. Some of you all need to repent from a generational curse, which is nothing more than a habit that's been passed down from generation to generation. Some of you all need to repent for the way that you eat. High blood pressure doesn't run in your family. It runs in the way you eat. Diabetes doesn't run in your family. It runs in the way you eat. Mm. Somebody just shout, repent. 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 The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent. Okay. Let me give you these six. Let me give you these six. Let me give you these six. Let me give you these six, okay. Uh, I don't know why I felt that. I ain't even give you none of them yet. Y'all just 
Point number one, please write this down. You need a plan. You need a plan. If you gonna get milk and honey and keep milk and honey, you need a plan. I can't tell you how many people have stepped into 2024. They have no plan. But they want milk and honey. Not even one or the other. They want both. Right now. With no plan. And whatever you don't plan, you won't keep. Some of y'all plan to be rich, but you don't plan to stay rich. Some of y'all plan to get married, but you don't plan to stay married. You went to premarital counseling, but you don't do no postmarital counseling. You maintain your vehicle more than you retain your relationships. <laughs> you need a plan. You need a plan. Every year we step into the new year with a plan. I, I, and I'm not like a big master planner. I don't have vision for five years. I just don't. I, I got vision for the next thing God said. And wherever he says, I just do that until he tells me to do something else. I'm super basic. I only got a high school diploma, so I don't have... So I don't have a 10-year plan and I got a goal for the next 100 years. I'm going to be dead. I don't... But, but I got a plan on how we're starting this year. Based on what I feel like the Lord has said, I'm like, okay, we're doing that. How long are we going to do that? Until God says something else. But he made a statement, and now we're putting a plan around it, and that plan is going to help us. Joshua got ready to fight the battle at Jericho. He needed a plan. In his own military genius, if he would have chose his own plan, they would have died. God's plan was much better, and it was foolish. I promise you God's plan was foolish. You're taking men of military might and telling them, walk around a building once a day for seven days. Then on the seventh day, walk around it and then shout. Then go kill them. What? We were making ladders. We were making grappling hooks. Yeah, because that's what you thought would get you to victory. Thank you for allowing me into your plans. I just saved you some steps. Point number two, please write this down. You need to perform. Once you have the plan, you need to perform. You have to act on it. I can't tell you how many people have plans and no actions. Man, I'm going to own a company one day. H have you registered the name for an LLC? No, nah, no, nah, you know, nah. Just waiting for God to come through. What? Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm, selling, I'm selling cakes out of my house. Okay. Yeah, I want to, I want to, I, I, I vision myself having my own cake shop one day. Okay. Have you looked at leasing buildings? Oh, no, that's expensive. So you're just going to keep slinging cakes from your house? You want people coming up to your domicile? <laughs> Is anybody going to really take you seriously? Will, will, will an investor give you a, a, a sizable loan? If you just got a plan but no performance? The children of Israel could perform. Prepare your victuals. In three days you shall cross over. We, we ready. We're ready to move. We're ready to act. You have to be ready to perform. Point number three, please write this down. You need patience. <laughs> you need a plan. You need to perform. And you need patience. Because there's no way you're stepping into the promised land and you're going to be done in a week. 
You cannot step into a place that's been promised for hundreds and hundreds of years and win it over in a weekend. There was a campaign that was involved. The children of Israel went into the central part of Canaan. Then they, after they conquered the, the central part, they went to the south. And then after they finished the south, they went to the north. There was patience involved. Jericho, then Ai. Let's line up the ites. Who we going after first? There's six things that we need to accomplish. There's six ites we need to get rid of. Which ite do we go after first? I know that there's, you, you, you got a revelation now, and you're like, you know what? I need to fix my marriage, and I need to fix my finances, and I need to fix my kids, and I need to fix my relationship with my dad. And let's, how about we just pick one? You ain't going to get through the kidites and the marriageites and the financialites and all them ites at the same time. Pick one and be patient. God, hold me down. I, there's a lot that I need to change, but I can only deal with this right now. And after I finish dealing with this right now, then I'll deal with this thing next. And after I finish that ite, then I'll finish with the next ite. Patience. I can't tell you how many people disqualify themselves from the promise because they rush. Jericho, victory, AI, the first time, defeat. Patience said, oh, let's stop real quick and ask what we did wrong. Because we need to have enough patience to know what do I need to do next? Point number four, please write this down. You need pacing. All these start with P's. I'm, I thought about it. <laughs> you need pacing. There is a pace that has to be sustainable for what God has called you to. This year I'll be married 25 years. January 14th, I will be saved 28 years. <laughs> February 25th, I would have been preaching 28 years. I preached my first sermon five weeks after I gave my life to Jesus. And this is how I've walked through ministry. I haven't been doing this. <laughs> Look at him. He's so, oh, he doing it. Oh, he's obtaining the promise. Oh, he's so, oh, he's so, he here, he there, he everywhere. Look at him. He just, he, oh, I saw him at that conference, that conference, that, he, and, whoo, God, you, whoo, whoo. My wife can't keep up with me. My kids can't keep up with me. That pace is absolutely unsustainable, unsustainable, but it looks good. We love ourselves a runner. We love to watch people run in ministry until they fall out. And here you are reading the entire New Testament of Jesus' three and a half year earthly ministry and the man never ran nowhere. Jairus caught Jesus when he got off the boat. Master, come quick! My daughter is dying! Jesus didn't go. <laughs> Do you know what would have happened if Jesus would have sprinted to Jairus' house? The woman with the issue with blood would have bled out.
Jesus did not let the urgency in Jairus' voice make him pick up his pace. Jairus, you want me to come be a deliverer in your house? It's going to happen at my pace. I'm not speeding up to fulfill what you want me to fulfill. I have a pace. My pace is slow enough to get to your daughter and for this woman with the issue of blood to get to me. See, you have to have a pace in life that's sustainable for the people that you want to walk through in life. See, I got time to be here today. I didn't come from another conference to get here today. This is actually my only preaching engagement of the entire month. You know why? I got a pace. I don't need to be everywhere to validate my ministry. I just need to be the places God tells me to be. Because I have a pace. I don't need the validation of men if I have the validation of God. I go where he tells me to go, and then I take my behind back home and sit in my house to the next place he tells me to go. Why? Because I have a pace. Somebody just shout out pace. Pace will keep you safe. Pace will keep you from burning out. Pace will keep you from making decisions in fatigue. Pace will keep you from making the wrong decision. Jesus' pace was so slow, he could notice when a fig didn't have fruit on the leaves. Jesus' pace was so slow, he could, not he could notice a, 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 a short man sitting up in a tree. Stuff you can't see running through ministry. You can see walking. Still got a date night with my wife. The church is Jesus' bride. Juliet is mine. If I got to choose between your conference and dating my wife, get another person to come to your conference. Because I'm not getting another person to date my wife. I don't know why I got to stay on this real quick, but I got a pace. Pace is sustainable. I was at my kid's acting class for the first time when he read through his monologue. I was there when he played the lead role in It's a Wonderful Life because I have a pace. I didn't have to apologize to my son and say, Daddy has to go to the thing over there. No, 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 I got a pace. And my pace is so sustainable, I have devotion with my kids every night, and they love God at 15 and 13. Why? Because I'm home during the week. I have a pace. <laughs> I can notice a change in their behavior because I'm slow enough. I have a pace. Son, your attitude's changing. What's going on right there? You've been hanging out with your friend. I told you I didn't like him that much, but now you're starting to bop like him. Bring your pawns back up in this house. You can't go over and spend the night over his house again if you're going to come home acting like that. Why can I notice that? Because I have a pace. You want milk and honey? You have to have a pace. Point number five, please write this down. You need a prayer life. You need a prayer life. Oh, Tim, no duh. How come you didn't put that point number one? Because sometimes when you put stuff as point number one, prayer, you won't do the other stuff. People think praying is planning and it's not. <laughs> people think prayer is performance and it's not people think prayer is patience and it's not people think prayer is pace and it's not it's prayer <laughs> Proverbs 16 and 9 says we make our own plans but the Lord determines our steps so I make my plan and then I submit it before the Lord in prayer and I'm like are you cool with this if you are, just, just say yes and I'll do it. But you can tear the whole plan up if you want to. But what you're not going to say is that I didn't, I didn't prepare. 
And I have a work ethic. I'm ready to perform everything that, that is here unless you... Boss, you got anything else you want to say? You are rabbi. You are just not savior. You are Lord. So you run my life. So is this cool with you? If it's not cool with you, I won't do it. But if you good, I'm good. We go. Need a prayer life. And I'm talking about a practical... Thank you, Holy Spirit. Mm. I'm talking about a practical prayer life, y'all. Help us. I have quiet time, and, and I, I get up between 4.30 and 5.30 every morning, uh, uh, not every morning, uh, Monday through Friday, to have my, my, my time with the Lord. Between 4 and 5.30, and, and my boys get up at 6, and uh, it's, a, it's a beautiful rhythm that I have. But I don't, like, pray during that time and read during that time, and I'm like, talk to you tomorrow morning. It might be two hours later. And I'm like, hey, Dad, real quick. What am I supposed to say on, on this email? Because I felt a little way the way they responded. And I don't want to just clickety-clack my way into pettiness. So could you watch my fingers and thumbs on this next keystroke? Because I don't want to misrepresent you you know I could cut them deep but I don't want to four hours later it might be regulate my mind Lord I don't know why this thought keeps invading me but it's been like five or six times and I know you don't like that thought um, I used to like that thought I can't like it now regulate my mind An hour after that, it might be, hey, uh, give me a word of encouragement for my wife. Because I went into a competition with, with the Lord a long time ago that I wouldn't have better words to say about his bride than I have to say about mine. I refuse to, to, to properly strategize and prepare a message for his bride. And I'm talking flippantly to mine. So if I pray before I approach his bride... I'm talking about, I'm, I, I want you to keep it basic. Like, like everybody just usually praying for miracles. But, but they're not praying for maintenance. I just pray to be maintained. Okay. Where are my note takers at? Great. All right, give me a recap. Point number one was? Need a plan. Point number two? Yes, y'all take good notes. Point number three. Patience. Patience, that's fun. Okay, point number four. Patience. Love y'all. Point number five. Prayer. Point number six, please write this down. You need to proceed. You need to move forward. <laughs> so, when I'm in a service, I, I, I'm, I, the, I'm a very audio visual person I'm take and I'm an empath and so I feel everything in the room and, and I'm trying to like focus but then like <sighs> I'm just overly stimulated by everything in a worship service and I'm sitting there while, while the uh, service is going and then we show the video announcement reiterating and answering some questions about the transition of the name from relentless to love story I'm just sitting there I'm like Ooh. And then Pastors John and Avatar get up and they say some more stuff. And I'm like, Ooh, Ooh. <laughs> and I'm, just, I'm sitting there. And then I'm like thinking about the message that he told me to preach about milk and honey. And I was like, oh, oh. And then I was like, but do I say it like that? Because if I say it like that, would it, would it feel some kind of way? Huh? And he's like, no, because both of them, I was like, oh, oh. <laughs> so <laughs> instead of just giving you all my reactions to what he said, let me tell you what he told me. So what had happened was, right, I'm sitting there, and he was like, relentless was the wilderness. Yeah. 
And I don't want you to look at the wilderness with a negative connotation. The wilderness is where they drew close to God. The wilderness is where they got the Ten Commandments. The wilderness is where they received the miraculous of, uh, of manna and quail. The wilderness was absolutely important. Here's why. Because the wilderness is the place that changed their palate. Anybody in here beside me ever been to a really fine restaurant? Like, 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 I mean, real bougie, upscale. They bring you so many dishes. You like, what is this? Like, you don't know what fork to use. Anybody been that in that environment first time? You like, I don't know. Is that a, I don't know. It's like 14 forks here. I have no idea which one to use. Do I, do I take one bite with each fork? And I don't know. I, I don't know. I'm not the type of person that acts like I've been there before, right? Here's what happens. Here's what happens in a very fine restaurant. They bring you the main course. And be, but before dessert, they bring you a palate cleanser. The palate cleanser is meant to do exactly what it's called. It is meant to cleanse your palate so that when you have the dessert, you don't have the yamminess in your mouth from your main course. The chef wants you to taste and see how good the dessert is. The children of Israel could not have made a beeline from Egypt to the promised land because they still had garlic, leeks, and onions on their breath. The wilderness was the place where the manna hit the palate, which tasted like nothing. Because he don't want to mix taste. So he gave them a food to eat that tasted like nothing. So it would cleanse the palate. So that by the time they got to the promised land. So what I heard the Holy Spirit say is that relentless has been your wilderness period. He's brought you out of so many things and he's allowed you to walk around and let stuff just fall off of you. It's just been falling off of you for the whole five and a half years. You've just had stuff falling off of you. You've, you, you've had lies fall off of you and you've had bondage fall off of you and you've had old mindsets fall off of you and you've had habits just fall off of you and he's allowed it to happen so that when you make the transition or on Resurrection Sunday, you can taste and see that the Lord. Resurrection Sunday is going to be your promised land. Resurrection Sunday is when you get to taste milk and honey. Resurrection Sunday is when you have a culture shift and you don't go back to the things of the past, but you stay for the things of the present into the future and on this first Sunday my assignment was simply to remind you that milk and honey is not just a shout and a dance it is a work and a plan and if you would plan you would perform and if you perform, you'll have patience. That patience will make you set a pace that is sustainable. And after you've set your pace, you can have a prayer life that will maintain everything that he has called you to do. And you can proceed into everything God has for you. Everyone standing. Listen, I've never preached this message in my life. You could go Google it in, you go Google my name every sermon I ever preached. I've never preached milk and honey anywhere in my life. I've never even heard it to preach it 
in my life. When God gives you a message like this, gives us a message like this, it's because he's ready for us. He is absolutely ready for us to step into everything that he's called us to do. You can't do that in 11 days, Israel. But come out into the wilderness with me and I'll teach you how you should worship me. I, and I know you're not ready because when your earthly representative left for like a, a few hours, you made a golden calf. You didn't know how carnal you were until you got out here into the wilderness. You didn't know how much Egypt had gotten into you until you got out of it. Part of the reason why God calls you out is so that he can get out of you what you don't even know was put in you. He does not want that to pop up in the promised land. So he deals with it in the wilderness. You were not ready for a love story a year ago. You were not ready for a love story two years ago. The fact that he would even get a burden for it now is an indication that God is peeking over the balcony of the heaven and saying, that is my son in whom I am well pleased. That is my daughter in whom I am well pleased. So God, thank you for this message. <laughs> thank you so much that you love us so much that you would talk to us like this. Like you talking to us like some grown-ups. Even though we your kids, you ready to give us some stuff that we will retain and maintain for the rest of our life. I thank you, Lord God, that you are establishing generational blessings that will last for a thousand generations. I thank you that our kids, 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 kids are going to wind up blessed because of the decisions we make this year. May we metabolize these points and ground it in Scripture. Jesus. Do exactly what you called us to do. Not for our credit, all for your glory. In Jesus' name. Amen. Don't leave unless you have to go to work. You're not that busy. Change the pattern of your life. It's not that much traffic for you to be getting out of here. This is not out of insecurity. It's about order and honor. You want God to do stuff for you. What if he left early on what you needed? I'm tired of a culture that makes God optional. But I watched people go to a game last night, Baltimore and Pittsburgh. They stayed in blinding rain for three hours, standing up, getting pneumonia for a game that doesn't matter and will leave church early to get in the car so they don't have to sit in traffic. Our priorities are jacked up. I need to say this real clear. That was one of the single greatest messages I have ever heard in my entire life. I want everybody in here who knows that was the word of the Lord to give honor to God's vessel, Pastor Tim Ross. Now here's what he doesn't want me to do, but I'm gonna do it. He has not asked for one thing, but he has been a conduit of blessings and revelation in this house while I was in my low place. And what a lot of people don't know is it was 10 years old when pornography and masturbation entered my life. I'm 50, so I was in the wilderness 40 years. 
You don't have to clap because it's my story, but because you're connected, you should be excited because I'm in my year 50, which is Jubilee, which is debt cancellation, freedom from bondage. And if it's on me, it's on you. That means freedom hits the house. Freedom hits the house. I wish that I would hear a word like that and not so into it. I'm going to say that again to all the elders, pastors, and leaders. I wish that I would hear a word like that and not get a seed in the ground. I don't know what you have to do, but every single human being who can hear me online and in this building gets something in your hands. I'm an electronic giver. We are going to sow into this man of God, his wife, and his sons. This is his only assignment all month. He didn't ask for anything, but I'm sowing. Who's going to sow into this word? I want everybody to get something in their hands. If you're going to do electronic giving like me, here's what I want you to do. I want you to lift it in the air. I'm sowing right now. And this is not like some of the churches you and I have gone to when they raise an offering and say, every penny is going to the man of God. And they have already wrote the check. Yeah, they make millions and we get hundreds. They pimped us, but God was took, he was looking out for us. Good. Good. So people want to know, yeah, just go ahead and give because we have a time stamp on it for those who want to make sure that the seed goes to the man of God. We, we know what time I said this. You're going to get this $87. You're going to get this $87 and go on home. You and your kids will have chicken wings from Wingstop Extra Ranch. <laughs> move quick. Y'all move slow like it's a funeral. You ain't looking at nobody. Oh, he look good. He look good. He don't, girl, he look good, Lurleen. Why do we say that at funerals? He look like himself. <laughs> but somebody don't look good. Ooh, they didn't look good. Well, they dead. What they supposed to look like? Mm, the chicken was dry too. I don't understand. They didn't even heat the chicken up in the fridge. They... Move quickly, saints. Who, who gave electronically? Let me see your hands. Wave it in the air. Pastor Tim, I just want you to see that the people you've sown into have sown back into you. I want you to see it and know it. People online right now are sowing because of what you've done. Now, while people are giving, there may be someone who needs to give something even more important than your money, and that's your soul to Jesus. If you want on the first Sunday of the year to give your life to Christ for the first time, or you want to rededicate your life to get this year started properly, or if you want to be a member of what God is doing at Relentless as we become Love Story, join me at the altar right now. You've got exactly 120 seconds to meet me at this altar. Here they come. Here they come. Y'all can do better than that for our new family. Y'all can do better than that. Here comes some new family. And she got her prom gown on. Welcome home. Listen, I'm gonna have my assistant get your information, okay? I've got three things we gotta do, but we will talk. I mean that. Here they come. Y'all got to do better than this. Make sure you get his information. He wants to talk to you. Come on, y'all. Y'all can do better than this. Look at what God is doing. Welcome. Young man. Welcome. Welcome home, my God. Good to see you, man. You good? Welcome home. I think y'all should clap a little more. Y'all see people are coming. Who else? Here they come. Let them through. Elders, turn around. Celebrate them. Somebody else about to come down this aisle. I don't know what you're scared of. Don't be scared. Come on down here. There's a blessing waiting on you. 
Who am I talking to? And next week, you're going to invite somebody to, to, the, to the new story. Next week, you're inviting someone. Who else is coming down this aisle? I'm going to give you 32 seconds. 30, 30 seconds. Anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody else? Do me a favor, everybody at the altar, lift your hands. Everybody behind them, either lift your hands or stretch your hands to our new brothers and sisters. We're praying together. Everybody pray. Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus. it's me. I confess with my mouth and believe in my heart that Jesus is Lord. Thank you for the blood that was shed for me. I receive the free gift of salvation, not through my works, but the finished work of the cross. The blood is enough to pay for all my sins. Now, Holy Spirit, come live inside and teach me how to be more like Jesus each and every day. You are my Savior and my Lord. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, and amen. Can we celebrate our new family? Welcome, 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 welcome home. I want all of y'all to turn this way. Walk with me this way. Y'all are following Jordan. Jordan's gonna get some information from you. Let's celebrate them as they go. Come on, let's celebrate them as they go. Have you been blessed today? All elders, pastors, and ministers who are going to be ordained after the close of the service meet us right here at the front of the altar. These first three rows, elders, ministers, and pastors, once we commence. All right, everyone's hands are lifted. Thank you for your patience today for our Rock family. And you know what? I'm going to stop saying that because the Cat Williams interview was two hours and 46 minutes. It's been seen 26 million times. People have the time. It's just what they want to spend their time on. So I'm not going to apologize for a move of God. It, it was as long as it needed to be so that we could get the word we needed so we could become the people God expects. And if God can use a murderer like Moses, Moses was a murderer. Moses was a murderer. He killed that man. Mur Moses was a murderer. Some of y'all don't know that song. Well, we got a little quartet on us. Ah, Moses was a murderer. Moses was a murderer. Buried him in the sand. Buried him in the low place. Moses was Stop. Okay. <laughs> Hands lifted. <laughs> <laughs> May the Lord watch between me and thee. <laughs> well, we're absent one from another. Uh -huh. I love the Let every heart say. Now unto him who is able to do exceeding abundantly above all you could ask, think, or imagine. Now unto him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before his presence with exceeding joy. To the only wise God be glory, majesty, dominion, and power, both now and forevermore. Amen, amen, and amen. Leave here with a shout. We love you so much. Rock family, we'll see you Wednesday at 6.30 for our ordination service.